All right, we are continuing our study on the Lord's church. And today we're kind of pivoting just a little bit. Uh, we're kind of kind of in, finished an introduction and uh, what the church should look like in prophecy and, and some things along that line. We'll be looking at uh, some other, when, when, you, when you study the Lord's church and you're trying to identify the Lord's church, we're going to look at things like the organization of the church. We're going to look at some things pertaining to the worship of the church, uh, the mission of the church. All those are very, very important. But in my view, my opinion, which isn't worth the hill of beans, when you're looking for what the church looks like, what the church of the Bible was compared to the church of the day, there's not a more important question we can ask than what must I do to be saved? To me, that's the most important question that anybody on the planet could ask. When you go to various religious organizations around us, if you ask that question, if you went to 30 different churches and asked, what, what does the Bible say on this? You'd probably get 30 different answers. Can we get that from the book? I believe the book is, the Bible is very, um, very specific in what it says pertaining to what must I do to be saved. As we mentioned, came in from mentioned last time or one of the previous times, I think one of the, the problems that people get themselves kind of hemmed into a corner sometimes is uh, co the, what conjunction you use. If I see this verse and I see this verse, seemingly different, perhaps contradictory, is way that some people would view it, they use the conjunction or. Should I take this verse or should I take this? I think in a case like that, we never use the conjunction or, it's always and. If the Bible says this, the Bible says this, they're both true. They're both true. So I think anytime we're talking about what must I do to be saved, we need to approach it from the idea of and. The Bible says this, what else does it say? And so always looking for what is, what is the complete answer on that subject. So over the next few weeks, and I want us to take our time on this, and I, uh, I, I want your input. Uh, I'm sure there's things I've left out that y'all can add and fill in some blanks, but I certainly want your input on this. We want to talk about what must I do to be saved? What does the Bible say on that subject? What is salvation all about? And so as we approach this subject, I always like to start with this. And uh, I know some people would believe I'm misapplying this, but if I am, I ask your forgiveness. Um, I know some believe this is a comparison of the old law with the new law. Could be. In the book of Hebrews, there's definitely that comparison made. My opinion is on this passage is talking about a summary of what the first principles of the doctrine of Christ are. And so I want to start with this idea. So in Hebrews 5, the context here is he makes a statement in verse uh, 10, I think it is, about Melchizedek. Verse 8 and 9 is one that Brother Joel quotes often about uh, the importance of obeying, that Jesus is the author of eternal, eternal salvation, all those that obey him. And then verse 10, the writer of Hebrews pivots a little bit and talks about Melchizedek. And he takes a, he kind of takes a side note on this, and he gets back to Melchizedek in chapter 7, but he makes this point. He says, of whom? Talking about Melchizedek. Again, he's about to get into a, a, a discussion, pretty deep discussion on Melchizedek. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. He said, I'm about to, I want to, I'm going to compare Christ to Melchizedek. And some of his comparison is not going to be real easy to understand. This is pretty deep is what he's saying. Notice what he said. He says, some of you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. All right. Uh, Hebrew writer, uh, Brother Joel often says Paul, and it, it, I think it probably is, but whoever, that's really neither here nor there who that is. But he says, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have one that uh, need that one teach you again, which be the first principles. So I want to talk about Melchizedek, but I'm having to go back and teach you first principles. All right, so first principles. I teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. I want to get into a more difficult concept of Melchizedek. I'm getting into the meat of the scriptures, and I'm still having to talk to you about the milk of the scriptures, is what I think he's saying here. I don't think he's talking about the Old Testament here. I think he's talking about the, the, uh, the first principles of 
the New Testament Christianity. Uh, it says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belong to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So it says, I want to get to a more difficult topic with you that I think you ought to be able to comprehend. Somebody as full age, a mature Christian, should be able to comprehend this. And there's a chapter division here, which I think is very unfortunate because this is a continuation of this same discussion. So it says, I want to talk about Melchizedek, but I'm having to go back and teach you basic principles. That's what it says here. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. He's not saying we're going to leave it in terms of false teaching, or error, or whatever. But it says, I want to talk to you about some other things. I don't want to talk about the basic principles. I want to talk about, make some comparisons of Melchizedek to Christ. It says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. I want to go to some other topics with you. Not laying again the foundation of. So as we look at this, and again, some would argue that these are some Old Testament concepts. Maybe we do read these things and some of these things in the Old Testament. Not, I would not convince all of them are, but all these are very fundamental to New Testament teaching. It's a Christian teaching. Uh, so think about what we're saying here. First principles, milk. Babe, principles, the doctrine of Christ, foundation. Not laying again the foundation of, I don't want to have to keep teaching you this, of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of the eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. So we will talk about these things some more, but I want to talk about Melchizedek at this point. This is my point. You say, what's the point of that? I believe he's saying these things are things that are supposed to be easy to understand. The idea of repentance from dead works is something that's supposed to be a first principle milk, something that a, even a babe in Christ should understand. The idea of faith toward God, that's a first principle of the doctrine of Christ. That's milk, uh, that's uh, babes should understand that foundation. Uh, doctrine of baptisms uses the plural there, and some people have a problem with that, we know we're under one baptism today, but in the New Testament, do we read of multiple baptisms? Yeah, we do. We read of the baptism of John as opposed to the baptism instituted by Christ. We read about Holy Spirit baptism. So that's something that is uh, important to understand. But the laying on of hands, a first principle. They had us talk about that in the Acts class. Of the resurrection of the dead. The, uh, there's something, too, that people try to make this really, really complicated when we talk about the resurrection. When you look at the New Testament, it's pretty easy as far as the facts. Now, the idea of us floating in the air to meet uh, the Lord is one of those mind-blowing concepts. But as far as the facts of that, it's easy to understand. Eternal judgment is easy to understand. So again, my point is, and again, if I'm misapplying this, y'all forgive me for that. But again, repentance, faith, baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment are things that are first principles, milk, a babe can understand it, foundation. So we want to delve into some of those ideas that are supposed to be easy to understand. Now, again, I want to hit this thing on baptism real quick, uh, too. Ephesians 4, 4 through 7 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, but into every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So we're today, we're under that one baptism, and we'll get into that more, delve into that more in some of the coming lessons. So uh, those things are easy to understand. So as far as a starting point, all right, how about children? Ba a newborn baby, a, lit a literal newborn baby, not a spiritual newborn baby, a literal newborn baby. Now, that is something that became a, um, a problem in early Christianity very early on has been passed on uh, to many other religions in the form of original sin. We'll talk about that more later on, total depravity, uh, things of that nature. But what does the Bible say about the fate of a little baby? Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3 and 4, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. All right, so what about a baby? Do we need to baptize a baby? Well, it looks like to me, if it says, except ye become as little children, ye cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, a little child must be okay in the eyes of God. 
I think, and I thought about that a lot, this idea that Augustine developed and John Calvin and others developed later on about us inheriting the sin of Adam and Eve and therefore a newborn baby, if it dies, is going to be lost. I think is a horrific uh, teaching. I think is blasphemous to say something like that. I got to see my three little girls as they enter the world. There is no way that anybody can convince me that they had died the moment they took the first breath. They'd have been lost in eternity. There's no way you can convince me of that. So we're going to talk about that, delve into the idea a little bit more later on. But so children have to be okay. If we have to be like a little child to go to heaven, you must conclude that a little child is going to go to heaven. Now when does that child reach the age of accountability? Well, again, that's a, another topic for another time. Uh, Charlie, you had a point. Well, I read some things in that book I got from uh, Ray Comfort. Be warned, people, to be aware of Jehovah's Witness. They want you to believe that Michael the Archangel was God off and was the God. Okay. And he said it's not right. Well, and that's true, Charlie. So we need to really need to be on the lookout for any false teaching of any type. And, you know, the thing that we all want, I know you feel this way, I feel this way, everybody in this room feels this way, we want truth. We don't want a teaching of men. We don't want a teaching of a man to be my guide about how to enter heaven. What does God say about it? What does His Word say about it? That's all that's going to matter. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 14, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such the kingdom of heaven. So this is uh, the next chapter after this. So again, the, little, uh, the kingdom of heaven is made up of people have a childlike attitude. Now, that childlike attitude is, I think, in terms of humility, uh, Paul made the statement in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 20, I believe it is. He said in Malice be like a, a child, but I forget exactly how words, but in wisdom be a man. So we want to we want to be able to think and so forth and reason, but in terms of malice, anger, humility, we want to be like a little child. So we want to have the characteristics. There are characteristics of little children that we need to have, I, I believe, in order to uh, enter heaven. Again, when is that age of accountability? I believe this is what Paul is talking about here in Romans 7 and verse 9. He has, has a discussion of, of, of this and, and falling to sin and, and trying to do right. It says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So again, every human being that's ever been born has been alive spiritually speaking. At some point, they become accountable, uh, accountable for their sins. They can understand right and wrong. They're going to be held accountable. Now again, when is that age? I don't know. Uh, and I open the floor up for you if you have some comments on that. I think it varies from individual to individual and from child to child. And I like to, I was kind of like to rely on the mercy of God in that respect. I think He's going to show some some grace in, in that. I think there's some gray area there. Uh, Brother Donald, you had a point. Well, you know, I think, you know how a kid is when they're wearing their underwear and stuff and they just come through the house and all of that. But you go in, open the room up, they're in the underwear, don't you come in here? Yeah. You know, I think that kid knows the difference. Yeah. Right and wrong. That's a good that. point. That's a good but point. I think around, you know, it varies 11, 12, 13. Yeah. You know, so the age of accountability, I agree with you 100%. You know, it's determined on each of the kids. We yes. all have had kids, got kids, have seen that happen. Yes. For sure. <laughs> Yeah. All different, all mature, quicker, or, or slower. Girls only do quicker than boys. Yeah. You know. Well, that's my thought. That's a great point. And I've heard people use the example of uh, Jesus at the temple in Luke 2, that he was 12 when he was having that discussion. And again, I don't think you could be dogmatic at 12 as the age, but I, I think you're right. I think about that age is about when a child becomes amenable at some point yeah. uh, to the laws of Christ. I can Good remember point. my boys. The, the mom go in their room and they said, Don't come in here. Yeah. I'm not fully dressed. And she said, yeah. I had you. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, they yes, they're accountable at that point. I think. Yes, sir. That's a good point. Charlie. Well, mm. one thing the Bible talks about train up the child to when he gets older, 
Who you are, who you know, uh, I guess you say no right. You should know right from wrong. Uh, true. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 this is a good passage along that line. Ezekiel 18, 20, if you really if you read the context here, Ezekiel 18 from about verse 19 or 20 through the rest of that chapter, verse, I think it ends with verse 31 to 32, is a great discussion uh, here. But verse 20 is, is a, a great passage here. It says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. So time out right there. So somebody that teaches, well, the sin of Adam is passed on through his children. So his son Seth and Cain and Abel, they inherited Adam's sin. I think we'd all agree we inherit consequences of sin. We suffer consequences because of what Adam and Eve did, the decision that they made. The fact we have death in the world today is because of what Adam and Eve did. So there's no doubt, it's kind of like the same thing I've seen this in school before. I've, I've taught kids and seen kids who, while they were inside, their mother was doing drugs or alcohol or whatever, and it affected them. Did that kid suffer consequences because of what the mama did? Yes. Is that child going to be held accountable for the sins that the mama committed? No, absolutely not. So if you say, well, there's, uh, there's consequences we inherit from Adam and Eve, yes, I agree with that. But as far as me being cast into hell or my children being cast into hell or anybody else being lost eternally because Adam and Eve did, no. Now, I think this passage proves that. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. And my dad might be glad about that passage right there. <laughs> the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Words, what it's, to me, in, in my simple mind, is we're all going to be held accountable for what we do, what I do in this life. I told y'all before, I wish I could get to heaven on the coattails of my mom and dad. I'd, I'd be in a pretty good situation if that was the case. But I'm not going to be able to do that. It's based on what I do. It's based on what I do pertaining to what God's Word says. So I'm going to be held accountable for the sins that I commit. I'm not going to be held accountable for the sins that of my parents or grandparents or, or Adam and Eve, as the case may be. So again, a terrible doctrine. That's, the idea of original sin is a horrible, horrific uh, doctrine in my uh, my mother, view. My mother put it so good. She used to tell us every time we had to sit on its own body, you know. I don't think you can get no plan. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's a great illustration. Yeah, great yeah. illustration. Yeah. So we'll look at the part two of that. In Acts, uh, again, in Matthew 18, 3, Jesus said, Except you become as a little child and humble yourself, uh, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So humility is so important. And we've talked about this uh, a few weeks ago. I'll hit this real quick. So this is, as we approach God's Word, I think it's important for people to be open to what God's Word says. Not preconceived opinions, not what men have said, but what does God say? Isaiah 66 and verse 2, God says here, But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. You know, you think, again, the illustration of a little kid with a parent. When a parent gets on that little kid, there's a little fear there related to what the mom or dad might do uh, f for what they have done wrong. And the same thing for you and I, it should be that way pertaining to God. That we love God, and that's the motivation. I heard, uh, I can't remember who it was, uh, somebody did a gospel meeting here years ago. It must have been 30 or 40 years ago now. And he mentioned that uh, in Proverbs 1 and verse 7, he said that uh, fear is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, so made that point, and then, but in First Timothy, I think it's First Timothy one and verse five, it says the end of the end of the commandment is love. So you think about, the, and some of y'all probably can experience have experienced this. When I became a Christian, what was one of the motivating things for me? A fear of if I didn't, what was going to happen to me? Now is is fear still a little? Well, it's still a little bit of that there. But my greater motivation today is love. As the older I get, the more appreciation I have for what God did and what God does for me every day and what Christ did for me. So fear is a motivator, but so is love. But anyway, my point is that if we respect God, you think about the, uh, the father-son relationship, well, spiritually speaking, that's the case with all of us. We have the father and we're his children. We're going to have a healthy respect for what God says. And so he says, I'm going to look to the person of a poor and a contrite spirit, one that trembleth at my word, that God said it, and I'm going to bust a gut to try to do it the way he said it. 
I'm not perfect. None of us are. But we want to do everything we can to try to live faithfully to the Word of God. In Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. Who does he dwell with? With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to abide the spirit of the humble, and to abide the heart of the contrite ones. Who is the Lord going to uh, dwell with? Someone that's contrite, has remorse for what I do wrong, not where I have a, a hard heart, as talked about in, in uh, one of the books of Timothy, talked about uh, our conscious being seared with a hot iron. That's a dangerous situation to get to. But my heart is open, contrite and humble spirit. In Psalm 34, 18, it says, The Lord is nigh or near unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. So I'm broken hearted over my sin, over my wrongdoing, have contrition, and I want to do better. I'm sorry for what I do wrong. Lord, tell me what you want me to do. Psalm 51, 17. Most people believe that David wrote this after his sin with Bathsheba and having her son, uh, her uh, husband Uriah killed. It says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, that will not despise. And if you want to know what a broken heart, a contrite heart looks like, read all of Psalm 51. You can tell David is broken hearted over what he did. I can't, it's like he's almost in disbelief. I can't believe I've done this. Lord, please forgive me. Have, that's what a contrite spirit looks like. Matthew 5 and verse 3, I've mentioned this to y'all before. The first beatitude. I've read this for years and really didn't make this connection, but I think that's what he's talking about here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. So the very first beatitude that Jesus mentioned is somebody that's poor in spirit, humble in spirit, contrite spirit. So in approaching what must I do to be saved, this is such an important element, I believe. <clears throat> now when it comes to sin, we all sin. That's the bad news. All of us sin at some point in time. Uh, in Romans 3, and here he's quoting, I believe from Psalm, uh, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, this first part, it says, what then? Are we Jews better than they Gentiles? And it's been a while since we talked about that. And here we talked this, uh, I guess, a couple years ago now. But in uh, Romans chapter 1, he's talking about the idea of the Gentiles being guilty of sin. In chapter 2, he's talking about the Jews being guilty under sin. And in chapter 3, he's saying we're all guilty of sin. Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Everybody on the planet is under sin. All of us at some point, again, a newborn baby is not guilty of sin, but all of us at some point in time are going to be held accountable for what we do. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is nobody on the planet. That's one of the, the points that Paul is making here. There's nobody on the planet that can say to God in Judgment Day, I lived however many years I lived. I lived 40, 50, 60, 80, 90, 100 years. I never sinned one time. Nobody can say that on the planet. So there's nobody, nobody on the Judgment Day that can go to God and say, I've earned this. Everybody is going to be saved by the grace of God. So we all sin. So there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're to, together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So again, there is not one person on the planet that can be saved without Jesus Christ. Not a person that can say that. You know, if we could do that, why, why did Jesus go to the cross? That's exactly right. You know, there wouldn't have been any. Our religious friends, you, you all know some of them, they say that uh, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, so you can do that. I said, no, that means strive to right. be that way. But Jesus, I mean, if you can live perfect, you have no need for That's exactly right. That's a great point, Brother Donald. That's one of the points that he's making to the Jews there in the book of Romans, because that was kind of their, their mindset. I'm a good Jew. I don't need Jesus. You know, basically, it was their, their mindset. But he's, he's trying to point out to them, yes, you do need Jesus. We all, we all do. We all mess up. That's a great point. Romans 3, 23, that same chapter says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody is going to sin at some point in time. Isaiah 53 and verse 6, All we like sheep have been born astray. Is that what it said? All we like sheep have gone astray. 
Now again, Augustine and John Calvin would say, you're born astray. That's not what it said. All we like sheep have gone astray. I can see that point. We're all going to sin. Again, the problem I have with Calvin and Augustine and some others is that we're not born a sinner. We're not born guilty of sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So anybody that reaches that age of accountability, this is going to apply to them. Anybody that reaches the, the uh, mature adult, whatever that is, is going to be in this category. All are sinners. All have sinned and need the sacrifice of Jesus. Well, think about what is sin. How is it defined in the Scriptures? In 1 John 3 and verse 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And uh, some of y'all know this better than I can. We've heard uh, preachers that say in the original Greek, the idea of sin is the idea of missing the mark. Just think of an archer aiming for a bullseye and you've missed the mark. We all do sometimes miss the mark, uh, as Brother Donald was saying a moment ago. But sin is the transgression of the law. The law says uh, this, that, or the other, and I fail to do it. So it's transgression of the law. Now, I, think, I think about it maybe more than just this, but thou shalt not, and then I do, but thou shalt not. Uh, James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So think about something that I know I should do, and I don't do it. And I've heard people describe it as things of commission and omission. That's, is a, scary, where, that's a scary verse. Right? That is a scary verse. Because probably all of us have been in times with that. We let opportunities go by us. Yes. So we could have done something good. You know, that's exactly right. Do it. Yeah, and that's why we all need that continual cleansing of the blood. Because I, you're exactly right, brother. This this gets me. You know, the thou shalt not, I'm, I'm pretty good on, on some of that. But the thou shalt, there's some of those that I, I, let, I know I let go. That I don't take it. That's a great point, brother. I, I know I'm guilty of that often. What are the results of sin? For the wages of sin... Think about, we think about wages being salary. So you think about, you know, people try to make, uh, paint sin as being such a, a good thing. You know, in Hebrews 11, I've always liked that where it talked about uh, Moses. We made the choice to, uh, he didn't want to uh, enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, but he chose God and chose what God had told him to do. Sin can be pleasurable, and Satan is great at painting it as being very pleasurable. They don't show you the hook in it. There's always a hook uh, in those things. But the salary, say, what's the payment for this thing that looks so glittery and people make it look so good? The wages of sin is death. That's what sin is going to bring about. And certainly, we all suffer physical death because of what Adam and Eve did, but each of us individually... If we have unforgiven sin in our life, and that's the key. How do we get forgiveness of sin? Because we all have sin, and we all do still sin. We, we leave things undone. But the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And again, it's talking about spiritual death. So sin will lead us away from God. And it's going, it, will, it will cause us, any sin that's not forgiven, will cause us to lose our soul. That's a sobering thought. In James 1, 13 through 15, I think is a great summary of this. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So if we say, I fall to sin, I can't point the finger at God. It's always interesting to me in studying, going back and studying Adam and Eve and, and uh, that first sin. When uh, Adam was questioned by God about what he had done, uh, who did Adam blame? Well, he blamed the woman. And then indirectly, God says, the woman that you gave me, God, it's really your fault. You gave me this woman. And Eve did the same thing. You know, so try to point out blame to somebody else. But it's not God. If we're saying it's not God's fault, what do we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? You know, God will not allow us to suffer beyond what we can bear and will with the temptation provide a way to escape. So God is always, He's on our side. He's cheering for us to avoid whatever pitfall that might be. But notice what it says. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so that's the result of sin. The same thing Romans 6.23 says, but it's a process. I, that, go ahead, Brother Juan. That When lust hath conceived, I've thought about that a lot of times. Is it possible to lust and not sin? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I, has it? Has it? 
conceived you. Yes. I think it's, it, it goes back to me, and again, my opinion of what it is worth. I think in Mark chapter 7 and Mark 5, uh, Matthew 15, Jesus says that whatever enters a man is not what defiles you, what comes out. Right. So I think there's, it's impossible for us, particularly in our society today, we are bombarded with all kind of, of stuff. You flip on the TV, you see a magazine, whatever, we're bombarded with that. But I think the, I think the point, the admonition is that we don't want to allow, allow it to, to grow, I think is the point. So when, when we're exposed to something, just try to put it out of our mind as quick as we can and not dwell on that. Because that's dangerous. If we, we see that magazine cover of that beautiful woman that's scantily clothed, and I, I dwell on that too much, that's going to lead me to some problems. Yeah, they <clears throat> deal with people blind God sometimes. Like, yes. Oh, God, make that woman look so good, and why didn't he create me a desire to yeah. own that woman? So it's his fault. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So I think that goes, it all goes back to training your own mind. Yes. That's what Christianity is all about. It, well, yeah, it's exactly right. To have those thoughts, not to, not to do the things that are wrong. To guard, guard our heart. Yeah. Uh, the uh, passage I, I love is Psalm 119, verse 11, that says, uh, hide, our word, hide your word in my heart, we might not sin against thee. So hiding, hiding his word in our heart. There's a passage, I forget where it is, some of y'all might know it, Dad might know it, in the book of Psalms where David makes a statement, uh, Lord, guard my mouth, basically. I want to say it's Psalm 141 or 41, I, I can't remember, but guard my So, yeah, I think we have to constantly uh, be on the lookout of guarding our heart and our mind and our words and this sort of thing. Uh, James 3 is one that gets me a lot. You know, talking about the, the tongue and how slippery the tongue can be. And uh, some people ask me, why have I gotten so quiet over the years? Because I put my foot in my mouth so many times, I'm, sometimes I'm scared to speak and say something. You're not that quicker than something. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard. It's hard to bridle uh, the mouth. I've heard Brother St. John, I can't remember the uh, statement that he uh, uses along that line sometimes, but we want to think before we speak. I think that's, and we're trying to tell our kids at school, and I, I, I try, I don't always see this too, with this too, but I've heard um, our principal, Thad Butt, say this. Sometimes he'll type an email response to an angry parent or whatever, and he'll sit on that for a day or two and then reread it and say, mm, maybe I need to tone that down a little bit. I think that's good advice. Same thing with these kids. They get upset and then they tweet something or text something or whatever, and it's out there. You can't take it back once you've said it. or It's hard to. We can be forgiven for that, but it may do damage that will be around forever. And so it's, it's important. And again, we can't live perfectly, but we want to do those things to guard our heart and our mind and our tongue to not let the lust grow and, and so forth. That's a great point. I thought it was another hand up a minute ago. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm always mind bad. I have to engage my mind before I engage my mouth because I'm twice as bad as you are. <laughs> Open my mouth and inserted my whole leg. <laughs> I've done the same. You I've know, done the same. All yep. Admitted, you know. Yep. Yep. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. All right, so what's the result then of sin? And this is the, the bad news. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities are separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that it will not hear. That's from a sin. Sin separates me from God. And that's what spiritual death is. That's a separation. So sin takes me away from God. Sin's going to cause me to be lost. As we said, we all sin. So the point is, how do we get that forgiveness? There's nobody, as Brother Donald said, there's nobody on the planet that can come before God and say, I'm perfect. It doesn't exist. Nobody can say that. So what is the remedy for that? How do I get forgiveness of these sins? The blood of Christ, as we know, is what cleanses us from our sins. Uh, and we may make this point again, but I, I think I've said this y'all a while back. Frank Chester had one of the best lessons on this I think that I've ever heard. We said people, um, and the subject was baptism, we'll talk about baptism more later on, but it says people stumble over baptism so much. And there's so much error out in religion over what the Bible teaches about baptism. But the problem is, there's two questions to ask. What saves us and when are we saved? That's two different questions. Nobody, there's no debate about what saves us. It's the blood of Christ. We have to have the blood of Christ on us to save us from our sins. That's what cleanses me. I can't cleanse myself. I can comply with what 
God has said, but I can't put myself into heaven. I can't put, I guess through my actions, I can put myself uh, being lost in hell. But I can't, I can't save myself. I have to have God to save me. And it starts with the blood of Christ. So what saves me is the blood. When does that blood save me? That's the question we're looking at in here. Matthew 26, 28. Jesus, as he answered the Lord's Supper, said, made this statement. For this, talking about this cup, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. His blood was shed for the remission of sins. We're going to look at that phrase, for the remission of sins, later on when we compare Acts 2.38. Acts 20, 28, uh, Paul, uh, speaking to the Ephesian elders, uh, meeting with them at Miletus, said this, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The, talking about the importance of the church, that makes that a pretty important institution, isn't it? If it was paid for by the blood of Christ. There was not a higher price that could have been paid for the church. Romans 5, 9 and 10. I'm going to get back to 6 through 8 uh, later. It says, much more than being now justified by His blood. That there is no debate of that. That's not a debatable thing. It's the blood that saves us. Again, the question is, when does that blood save us? The blood, we're justified by His blood. We should be saved from wrath through Him. He's going to save us from eternal condemnation through His blood. For if when we were enemies, before we became a Christian, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we should be saved by His life. And that word reconciled is used uh, several times here uh, in this context. A fancy sign of word, reconciled or reconciliation. All it means is being made friends again, to, to be made one again, to, to be able to be at peace with one, one another again. So how are we reconciled with God? We became an enemy to God by our own sin, as Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says. Sin separated me. My sin, my iniquities, not Adam and Eve's, my sins separated me from God. But how are we made whole? through His blood. So we're reconciled to God by the death of His Son. We're justified by His blood. Ephesians 1 and verse 7 says, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace." And the idea of redemption is a, a neat word too, the idea of being bought back. Whereas that we became a slave to sin. Romans 6 uh, makes that comparison. So we all sin and we become entangled in sin. There's no way to get out. Romans 7, I think, is what Paul is talking about. The, talking about the hopelessness of somebody outside of Christ that wants to do right and they can't do right without Christ. We're entangled. The only way to get out of that entanglement is through Jesus. So we're redeemed. We're bought back. He bought us from the slavery of sin through His blood. And we have forgiveness of sins through His blood. Ephesians 2, 12 and 13, that at that time, words before you became a Christian, that at that time, and he's talking about the Gentiles uh, specifically here, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were an alien. Uh, you, you were not a part of the family of God. You were not part of the, the people of God. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Isn't that a bleak picture? It's a pretty sad picture. To be without hope? One of the greatest things in life is hope. Even we're going through difficult times, and we've all gone through difficult times. Some of y'all a lot more difficult times than I have. But we all go through difficult times. We go through challenges. We go through obstacles. What gets you through those dark moments in your life? Hope. Hope is what gets you there. But without Christ, there is no hope. Without God in the world, what a sad thing that is. But notice this next part. But now, now... The, whole, the tone has changed. You're now a Christian. You're now in Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, and there's the key, being in Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. We were an alien. We were a stranger. We had no hope. We were without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, we're made nigh, close to God, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, Charlie, you had a point. All right, in 1 Thessalonians uh, 1, 9, it says, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not write until ye for ye yourselves 
or a child of God to love one another. And that was uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, you said? 4 and verse 9? 4 and 9. And then there's another one we're going to look at later, Charlie. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 uh, that talks about uh, turning, repentance. Uh, we're going to get to that one later too. Yes, great passage. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. We looked at this the other day in relationship to the kingdom and us being citizens of the kingdom. It says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, God speak as talking about God here, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The most important need we have in life is forgiveness of sins. Not a greater need that I have. But we're redeemed through his blood. Hebrews 9.22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So again, it's through the blood of Christ that we have that remission. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, you can't buy your salvation. Someone says, well, if I give enough, are we commanded as Christians to give? Sure. Can I give enough to buy my salvation? Absolutely not. There's not an amount of money that matter who it's Bill Gates, and I don't know Bill Gates' spiritual condition, but he's a very wealthy man, but he can't buy his salvation. Uh, other wealthy individuals in our country, they can't buy their salvation, no matter how much money they have. They all got to come to Christ the same way. So we were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, money, we can't buy it, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. I've always thought that's a beautiful, uh, beautiful how that's phrased. The precious blood of Christ. That's what redeems me. That's what buys me back. That's what saves me from my sins. Revelation 1, 5, and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He is the one that washed us from our sins in His own blood. So He, or the Father, or the Spirit, I tend to think of in my own mind, the Holy Spirit uh, performing an operation on us and applying the blood to our soul to cleanse us of our sins. But however that happens, the blood of Christ is what washes us from our sins. Revelation 5, 9 says, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So that idea, there's not any debate about that. It's the blood of Christ that saves us. Again, the question is, how do we obtain the blood of Christ? How is that applied to my soul? All right, we'll pick up with that next time. Appreciate your great comments and your good attention this morning.